All right, everybody, welcome back. This is bonus lectures, Machiavelli's discourses, 16 to 18, transition from servitude to freedom. It's still book one. We are building on last time where we talked about religion and its necessity. So this is now how do you get out of servitude? Okay, let's jump on in. So chapter 16, the subsection 16 is, quote, a people accustomed to live under a prince, should they become eventually free, will with difficulty maintain their freedom. And to quote him, quote, how difficult is it for a people accustomed to live under a prince to preserve their liberty, should they by some accident acquire as it as Rome did after the expulsions of the Tarkins, who were the kings. Um, and it's shown by numerous examples, which may be studied in the historical records of ancient times. So not a good record, right? Trying to do this, trying to reestablish or establish ever a free republic out of a, anything that's been serv servile. Um, and we don't need ancient examples, right? Think about uh, everywhere that freedom was planted in the last 40 years by force didn't go well, right? Why? This is what Machiavelli hopes to explain. Uh, and his examples, this is what I love about early modern thinkers, man. They pull no punches. So here we go. Um, he mentions a couple things. He says um, there should be such difficulty um, that there should be such difficulty is reasonable, for such a people differs in no wise from an animal which, though by nature fierce and accustomed to the woods, has been brought up in captivity and servitude, and is then loose to rove the countryside at will, where, being unaccustomed to seeking its own food and discovering no place which it can find refuge. It becomes the prey of the first comer who seeks to chain it up again. <laughs> so humans' natural state, right, we're fierce. And too much servileness can make us docile. And just waiting for the next person to come leash us. Wow. I mean, you know, he's... Mm. And of course it's the same with people. He says the same thing happens with people. Eminently, right? Like, he didn't let you fit. He didn't, like, try to hide, you know hide it from you, uh, who have been accustomed to live under foreign rulers, and so have taken no thought to either public defense or offense, and when acquainted with, oh, acquainted with no prince, nor yet any uh, are acquainted with it. Forthwith returns to the yoke, oft times a heavier one, than which a while back they threw off their neck. It's just a problem throwing off a yoke, right? Uh, what if you can't hold it? What if you can't defend? You have no virtue, you have no civic pride. And even more fundamentally, no ferociousness, right? You have no will to hold. So it applies to people too, obviously, right? Uh, and again, this should be amply proven by history. Um, he says here, But since a people which has become wholly corrupt cannot even for a brief space, no, not even for a moment, enjoy its freedom, as we shall show later, we shall confine ourselves to the present discourse to people whom corruption has not advanced too far and in which there's still more goodness than rottenness. So this still only applies to servile people who are not totally corrupt. And what is the metric for totally corrupt? More goodness than rottenness. And again, if, if anybody wants to be a relativist and like, what is that man by good? Just think basic Christian virtues, apply them, right? Uh, you know, fortitude, temperance, wisdom, uh, justice, you know. And apply those. That's what it means. The Greek virtues, right? That's what we're saying is the good, right? Focus on beauty and truth. Um, so, you know, again, these words mean what they mean. So you need to not totally corrupt people. Step one. All right. And then, basically, the problem with any of this, right, is... There's another problem, is, is that in the government of the state which has become free evokes factions with are hostile, and not factions with are friendly. So basically everybody who's mad, like, so being free just makes everybody pissed off, and you don't get any friendly faction. And it mentions a lot of people will prefer the tyrannical government, and it'll keep trying to reassert itself. And people who had a lot of benefit under tyranny will try to get, they'll try to regain the authority of it. This is just happens. And then you run into the problem. Um, 
it's hard to get active supporters who are friendly, right? So self-governing estate assigns honors and rewards only for the honest and determined reasons. And apart from this, rewards and honors no one. And when it acquires honors or advances which appear to they have deserved, one does not acknowledge any obligation towards those responsible for the remuneration. So the problem with free states is they actually try to give honors fairly and nobody is giving you the honor right society is giving it to you so you don't like make a lot of friends doing it um, and the biggest problem here it mentions furthermore that common advantage which results in self-governing state is not recognized by anybody so long as it's possessed so it's easy to not see that they incur obligations, but they get a lot of benefits from a free state until it's gone, right? People are really bad at seeing it, just straight up. It's hard for people to understand it. All right, now this one is great. Um, they said, it is then, as I have said, the government of a state which is free and has been newly formed will evoke hostile factions, but not friendly factions. If then one desires to remedy these difficulties and to cure the disorders which the aforesaid difficulties bring about, there is no way more efficient, more sure, more safe, or more necessary than to kill the sons of Brutus, who, as history shows, would not, together with other Roman youths, have been so induced to conspire against their country, had they not been that, under consuls, they could not attain outstanding positions. Um, and under the king, so the freedom of the people was for their point of view, but servitude. So. What's the principle here? Uh, you have to kill the sons of the Brutuses. Brutus stabbed Caesar, right? So if you're founding a new state and somebody goes against you, you have to take vengeance on him and his fully. And this is where the prince side of Machiavelli comes out. He's just being a realist, right? If you leave your enemies alive, who hate you, right? The blood relatives of your enemies who have not reformed or anything. You just didn't kill them or exile them or whatever, or take all their honor, and you allow them to get honor and position again, they're just going to be hostile to you, obviously. Like, it's eminently true, of course. So at the very least, you should prevent them from ever getting position again. Why would you give position to your enemies? This should be an obvious thing, right? So what's the principle here? And again, it's still Machiavelli, right? So we always have a principle. You must secure yourself against those who are hostile to the new order, right? So, and he points them, this is in a free state or a principality. So if you found a new state or principality, you have to secure yourselves against hostiles. Otherwise, what's going to happen? Like, they're going to they're gonna stab you or overthrow it. And he says, um, those who are hostile, setting up a form of government which will be short-lived if you don't do this. Pretty obvious, right? It should be clear. Uh, is there anything else I want to add here? Oh, and then the key here then, okay, if we're going to try to hold this, Let's speak now of a prince and a republic. Um, he's going to talk of princes first. He, he generally talks about republics, but he makes a point here. He says, um, I speak of such princes as have become tyrants in their own country, that which I say he ought to first to ask, what is that that people desire, and that he has always find that they desire two things. First, um, to avenge themselves against the persons who have been the cause of their servitude, and to regain their freedom. The first of these demands the prince can satisfy entirely, the second in part. So these are the two things the masses desire, right? They want vengeance, people have been cause of their servitude, and they want to regain their freedom. So a prince can always give them vengeance and give them some freedom, and that's a, it's a good strategy, basically. All right. Um, and a part of this, too, he mentions um, when you're trying to satisfy the popular party and you should um, he says um he says, this is funny it's actually related to this one still he says so choosing a suitable opportunity he cut to this is from a roman ex um where is this pretty sure it's a roman example let me see i think it's a greek tyrant they're talking about um and he had a controversy and he he got exiled and came back uh and then when he got back he cut to pieces all the nobles so to immense the satisfaction of the popular party, and in this way satisfied one of the demands of the populace, namely, the demand for vengeance. <laughs> so, if you haven't ever read this book, just the examples themselves are priceless, right? But he's, he's being a realist, right? Killing the nobility who had harmed the regular people made them popular. 
And again, we, we might look back and go, oh my gosh, that is so, oh, it's brutal. Well, here's the thing, right? We live in a time when a lot of people, um, how can I say, it? people have blinders to their own side. That is basically standard operating procedure for all of history and 20th century. Uh, everybody did it. Um, I mean, don't get me wrong, communists did it more, let's be honest. But I mean, uh, you know, uh, right-wing presidents did it too. It's not unheard of. But I mean, the communists were professionals at this. And I mean, it, you know, it got them 70 years. <laughs> so, there's something here. Now, on, on the restoration of freedom, a prince can't do this, obviously, right? But, a prince can at least... Let's see here. He will find that a small selection of the populace desire to be free in order to obtain authority over others. You can't do anything about those people. But the vast bulk of those who demand freedom desire but to live in security. And he makes a great point here. The basic freedom people want is security. They want peace. This is almost Hobbesian. Hobbes comes after Machiavelli, by the way. But people just want peace. Like, let me live in peace. Let me have my life. Let me be secure from bandits and, you know, rapacious government. And he mentions... Um, and it doesn't matter if a state is 40 or 50 people, right? Um, it's an easy thing to make yourself secure in the regard, either by doing away with them or granting each one of them a share of honor according to standing. So even in a small state, you can live in security, and you can satisfy those people who don't want to dominate other people. And he mentions uh, France, actually, is a pretty good example of this. Uh, where is this? People live in security simply because the kings are pledged to observe numerous laws on which the security of all their people depends. So kings in France were free to do as they want. He mentions this in terms of weapon, you know, military and finance, but in respects they had laws like how they treat the peasants. And giving peasants that security, you mostly make them happy. And he says a prince therefore or republic which should not be made its government secure at the outset must take the first opportunity of doing so as the Romans did. He who fails to do this will repent too late of having omitted what you ought to have done. <laughs> so there you go, you have to give peace, security at least. Now we always get Roman examples here. It says, thus, since the Roman people were not yet as corrupt when they regained their freedom, they were able to maintain it. When the sons of Brutus were dead, and the end of the Tarquins, by means of those methods of government, and other institutions which are discussed elsewhere. On the other hand, this people already became corrupt, neither in Rome or anywhere else. Would the remedies be adequate for its maintenance to be found? And we'll get an example of that next. So, but if you're an uncorrupt people, this strategy will work. If you're corrupt people, <laughs> good luck. And, uh, yes, I do have all Italian government pictures. I, what's the relationship there, might you ask? <laughs> Italy was corrupt in Machiavelli's time, let's just say it that way. Okay. So the next chapter, 17, a or subsection, I'll say, a corrupted people having acquired liberty can maintain it only with the greatest difficulty. And he said, in Rome it was inevitable in my opinion, um, yeah, that either the king should be removed or that a very short time the state would have become weak and of no account because if one considers how corrupt the kings had become, it is clear that in the course of two or three generations, the corruptions inherent in the kingship would have begun to spread to the members. And when the members become corrupt, it would no longer have been possible to reform them. And this is one of those unifying theories in Machiavelli, man. Corruption spreads, right? To have any non-corrupt government, and especially a free republic, you must have uncorrupt people. And what's the downside of a, you know, a prince, right? A prince influences his people. So a corrupt prince will make his people more corrupt. Now, the converse is also true. A good prince will make his people good, right? So virtue is really important here. And again, I, I will contend. I, in my academic opinion, this is one reason Machiavelli is undertaught or not taught. I mean, okay, I teach him, but I'm not sure anybody else does. He advocates for ethics in government, right? And it's a direct correlation. I'd say it's a very Christian view. and I think it's also descriptive of reality. Now, what is the solution, then, if you have one of these states? Well, strong leader can do it. But this you're going to run into a kind of a, a hard pass here, which is... Um, so such freedom, however, will last only as long as the, this lord lives. Even if he's a good man, right? A good, uncorrupt man ruling will only, if the society is corrupt, it'll only last his life. It says, and for an example, this happened in Syracuse, in the case of Dion and Timelion, 
whose virtue was such that both occasions the city remained free as long as they lived, but they when were dead, it returned to its ancient tyranny. So strong leaders aren't enough, right? At best, they'll get you one rule. If the people themselves aren't reformed, it won't matter. Uh, I mean, does this have modern connotations? Of course, right? It's political theory. It still applies today. Um, now, extreme. Now we get an example of extreme corruption. Again, this is a Roman analysis in the end, right? And he says, and again, can any example be found that was better than Rome? Um, he said, in the later period, Rome was extremely corrupt. Um, and in the former case, so when Rome was new, the people were, um, in order to stiffen the people up and keep them averse to a king, it sufficed to make them swear never to consent to a king ruling in Rome. But in the other period, the late period, the authority and severity of Brutus, backed by all the legions of the East, did not suffice to keep them disposed to the desire that liberty should be maintained. And this was due to corruptions, which, uh, with which the Marian faction had impregnated the populace. For when Caesar became head of this faction, he so successfully blinded the masses that they were unaware of the yoke which they themselves placed on their necks. They themselves placed on their necks. So here's the thing, right? The consent, everybody. You must yoke yourself. <laughs> Such a great... I love Machiavelli. It's so good. So in this Roman example, right, the, the plebs yoked themselves. They allowed themselves to be yoked. Everything is consent. It always was. It always is. It's amazing. And he says, though the example of Rome is preferable to any other, I propose to add to it further. Uh, he gives an example of what befell Naples and Milan, and this is, of course, in the Renaissance period. However grave and however violent in character could ever bring them freedom, since their members were wholly corrupt. And they mention, he gives an example of a guy named Philippe, uh, Filippo Visconti. So when he was, uh, he gave Milan freedom. It could not be done, nor could any means of maintaining it be devised. Rome, then, was extremely lucky that its kings quickly became corrupt, and as a result they were exiled before their corruption had penetrated the bowels of that city. Whew! <laughs> Need I say more? I love this book. I love it. So, and that, those are the examples of some places being so corrupt they can never be parade, uh, free. So, Milan and Naples, for example. <laughs> so I shouldn't laugh. I mean, Naples, southern Italy is still corrupt. It's really funny. Uh, and again, Matt Gilley would say it's a self-yoke, right? You want, they have yoked themselves. Now, the conclusion here is very interesting. Um, it is possible then to arrive at a conclusion. When the material is not corrupt, Tumults and other troubles do not do no harm. Interesting. But when it is corrupt, good legislation is of no avail, unless it can be initiated by someone in so extremely strong a position that he can enforce obedience until such a time as the material has become good. And then whatever, uh, wherever this has ever happened, or wherever it was possible to happen, I do not know. <laughs> And he says, for just if I have said it, it is clear that if a state which is on the decline owing to the corruption of its material, a renaissance is ever to be brought about, it'll be by the virtue of some one person who is then living, and not by the virtue of the public as a whole, that good institutions are kept up, and as soon as such a person is dead, they will relapse into their former habit. Whew. And for that, he finds examples. He gives an example of Thebes, um, where they had a republic, and then as soon as the leader died, it went away. Um, and we get here, um, just a reiteration, right? So, and this is the Thebian. So actually, I'll read the story. He says, so this happens in Thebes, which the guy um, named Epamidonius successfully maintained a republican form of government. Um, but when he died, it became disorder. The reason that no individual can possibly live long enough for a state which has long had bad customs is a good one. Unless a man lived for a very long time, or one virtuous man succeeded by another. I start that. That's important. So if you have a lineage of good men, virtuous men, they might be able to fix it. And organize in it on their passing away, as we have said. There would be collapse unless the renaissance is brought about at considerable risk and with no small bloodletting. For corruption of this kind and ineptitude for a free mode of life is due to the inequality one finds in a city and 
to restore equality is necessary to take steps which are by no means normal and this few people either know how to do or are ready to do and at point it will be dealt with in detail in another place he'll deal with it later but you basically need extreme measures to have a renaissance and fix the problem and as he points out here right the, the, another edgy thing that's modern cities are a core of this problem <laughs> Oof. so and again this leads us right into the next section i love it and uh, this is another italian parliament because it's fun okay the next section, um this one's called 18 how corrupt cities how in corrupt cities a free government can be maintained where it exists or established where it does not exist man it's like this guy's giving us some hope or something uh, let's go so he says uh, it will not I think be foreign to my purpose nor contrary to any plan of previous discourse to consider whether corrupt city is possible to maintain free government and um, he said in regard to this question I maintain that it is either in either case will be a very difficult thing to do. It's hard, like and he says it's almost impossible to lay down rules. Because to lay down rules requires on how corrupt it is, and if it's really corrupt you can't lay down any rules. So and by the way, when he's talking about a free state, uh, the footnote mentions something here. It says Uno Stato Libero, like so one state of liberty. It says free in the sense that citizens are free to choose their own government. So that's what, when he says free, that's what he means. It's still pretty broad. Okay. And he makes a point here, right, that laws rarely change institutions. Now, let me read. He says, he says even in a corrupt system, right? So he says, um, he says, even if institutions and laws made in the early days of a republic when men were good, no longer serve their purpose when men have become bad. <laughs> and if by any chance the laws of the state are changed there will never or but rarely be a change in its institutions the result is that new laws are ineffectual because the institutions which remain constant corrupt them right You're, you, so in, in institutions the enforcement mechanism for a law so you change the law put it in a corrupt institution it's going to corrupt the law <laughs> And if it didn't happen, you're just super lucky. Okay, and uh, keep going. So, and he points out too that corrupt laws are basically put it, they're put into place as citizens become more corrupt. What's the, what's the reverse implication, right? Um, you don't need as many laws when citizens aren't corrupt. So he says here, um, there was a... Um, these laws are introduced step by step as citizens became corrupt, but since the institutions determining its forms of government remained unchanged, and when corruption had set in, were no longer good, these modifications of laws did little suffice to keep men good. And he mentions the laws they make um, adultery laws, sumptuary laws, laws concerning ambition, many others. So once you start legislating behavior, you've already lost the quality of the people. Does that make sense? Like you're chasing. You've already had corruption. You're chasing the corruption. So you can't fix the problem with law as well because you're already behind the curve, as it were. So again, how do you fix it? Fix the people. Virtue. Um, and he makes a point here that, uh, um, it is, that it's true to say that such institutions would not be good in a corrupted state is clearly seen in two important cases, in the appointing of magistrates and in the making of laws. Uh, it mentions the Romans uh, had never given consulate or any other such important office of the city except to such as applied to the post. Right, you have to apply to the job. Uh, why do we care about that? Let me get here. Well, who's going to apply for jobs? Right, this is the United States and all modern democracies run into this problem. Um, the institution was at the outset good because only such citizens applied for the post as judged themselves worthy to fill them. And, reject, and to be rejected was to look upon as ignominious, so that everybody behaved well in order to be judged worthy. They had honor, right, and morals. This procedure in the city became corrupt, was extremely harmful, because those who had more virtue, oh, because not those who had more virtue, but those who had more power, applied for magistrates. 
right? So when, it, when it's good, virtuous men choose to enter. But in a corrupt system, when there's a lust for power, people who want power strive for positions instead of virtuous men. And then people pick them too. Um, and they said the powerless, though virtuous, refrain from applying through fear. And, um, and it doesn't come about all ones, it comes about through stages, obviously. When the Romans conquered Africa and Asia, they reduced a greater part of Greece to subjection. And, um, and once they did that, they had no enemies fear. So this sense of security in Rome and, and this weakness on the part of their enemies caused their own people to the appointing to consulate to consider not a man's virtue but his popularity. And then what's wrong with that? It draws men to the office who knew better how to get around men, not those who know how to conquer enemies better. So they started to elect people who aren't good at the job anymore, right? They're, they're popular. <laughs> uh, and this is the Roman consuls. Consuls are like a president, non-wartime president. Although they basically, had, instead of having a single uni unitary legislature like America, they had a yearly elected consuls, but two who were co-equal in power. It was their way to keep, um, this should be a capital R too. Man, gotta respect the ancients. There we go, I'm fixing it. Oh, I feel better now. There we go. But so the Roman consuls, right? The Romans had two consuls. So originally they'd pick on virtue, and eventually they picked popular men. And, and they pay the price for it, right? So, okay. And then... And uh, this is interesting too. Machiavelli is not strictly against public opinion, but he's against like what is the opinion? And he said again, a tribune or any other citizen can propose the people a law in regard to which every citizen was entitled to speak, either in favor or against, prior decision being reached. This institution was good so long as the citizens were good, because it always, it was always a good thing that anyone anxious to serve in the public should be able to propose his plan. So in Rome, they actually let you propose plans and laws as a regular person. You didn't have to be a representative, which was great when people were good, right? But it is also good that everyone should be at liberty to express his opinion of it, so that when people have heard what each has to say about it, they choose the best plan, right? So best means good, right? So if people are trying to choose the best plan, isn't that, it's great. But when the citizens become perverse, this institution became a nuisance because only the powerful propose laws and for the sake of, not of their common liberties, but to augment their own power. And again, it scared the good people to not talk. Does this sound familiar? Hmm. <laughs> it's like lobbying and war. <laughs> and foreign interventions. Man. Oh, right? These patterns just, they keep coming back. And I, I wonder if this is why people don't like Machiavelli too. He seems to be very good at attributing cause to political events and people quite interesting. And it's why we should still read them. I mean, this is a great warrant for uh, the, the relevance of Machiavelli. All right, moving on. Uh, we're still in the same chapter. But this is such a good chapter, chapter 18. I wanted to keep going in it. He, so now he gets into how to reform these institutions. Okay, so we have this semi-corrupt or very corrupt city. How do we reform? So again, he's... So what is the plan? So, well, he goes to Rome. So in order to maintain Rome's liberty, therefore, when corruption had set in, it was necessary for the course of this developed to introduce new institutions, just as there had been made new laws. For different institutions and different procedure should be prescribed for the government according, as they are good or bad, since familiar forms cannot subsist in matter which is disposed to contrary matter. Right, good can't come from bad, if you just put a bunch of good in the bad, it will become bad if you're not careful. So he said, now defective institutions must either be renovated all at once, as soon as the decline from goodness is noticed, or little by little, before they become known to everybody. So that's the, the goal here. And he says, and neither of which course, uh, neither of which courses is possible, I maintain. Like it's reforming a corrupt institution, Machiavelli doesn't even think is possible. Why not? Um, he says, for to take the place of little by little, there needs to be someone who will see the inconvenience coming while it's far off and in infancy. And while that could happen, um, yeah, he, should he arise, this virtuous person, he will never be able to persuade others to see things as he does himself. For men accustomed to a certain mode of life are reluctant to change it, especially when they have not themselves noticed the evil in question, or had their attention called to it by conjectures. 
And when you try to modify it all at once, that also doesn't work. So. And like he says here, right, defective institutions must either be renovated all at once or uh, not at all. And he says, again, right, um, he says, it won't work because, uh, here we go, I would point out that though it's easy to recognize their futility, it is not easily to correct it once an institution is fully corrupt. For to do this, normal methods will not suffice now that normal methods are bad, right? You can't use normal methodology when the method is corrupt. It won't work. It's already corrupt. So what's his solution? He says it here. Um, and, and this is probably even get a virtuous man. He says, hence it is necessary to resort to extraordinary methods. Ooh. What are extraordinary methods? I want to keep the PowerPoint. I'm so excited. Extraordinary methods must be resorted to, which includes force, use of force, and appeal to arms. And before any th doing anything, to become a prince in a state, so that one can dispose as one thinks fit. So as he already pointed out, right, to fix a republic, you need a single re leader with a unified vision. Um, but you can't reform corrupt institutions themselves. You have to axe them with force. And they can't, be, they can't be reformed step by step because if it's corrupt already, the people in the institution will stop your steps, right? You have to just ax the thing. And this is the problem he runs into, right? To reconstitute a political life in a state presupposes a good man, whereas to have recourse to violence in order to make oneself prince in a republic supposes a bad man. Hence, it is very rarely that we found a good man ready to use bad methods in order to make himself prince, though with a good end in view, nor yet a bad man who, having become a prince, is ready to do the right thing, and whose mind it will occur to use that authority which he has acquired by bad means. So this is kind of the paradox we run into. Now, does it never happen? No, it happens, but it's difficult. So, um... He says, on this account, it is um, of all this, it is difficult or rather impossible either to maintain a republican form of government in states which have become corrupt, or to create such form afresh. Should a republic simply have to be created or be maintained, it would be necessary to introduce it, a form of government akin rather to monarchy than democracy. So his solution is, you, it, a, a failed corrupt republic has to go to monarchy, that's the transition. So that those men whose arrogance is such they cannot be corrected by legal processes may yet be restrained by some extent by quasi-regal power. To try to make them become good by any other way would either be most brutal or most impossible. And he gives a bunch of examples he talked about before. And he said, it should, however, be noted that neither one nor the other had subjects seeped in corruption. So they meant, even the examples he mentioned where they reformed and used violence... The, the subjects weren't that corrupt. So he's, he's like, maybe even then it wouldn't work that well. Oof. So again, a lot of things in here. So conclusion, like how does this wrap together? I was already 40 minutes. It's pretty good, right? It's hard to corrupt a state. He basically says, uh, monarchy or nothing. That's how you, like a really corrupt republic. Now, it's easier if the republic has some good and some bad elements, right? In that way, you can reform the republic itself, and then you can work on the institutions, you know, make new ones or axe old ones as needed. And But still, right, he points out, uh, liberal use of force is still required. So, uh, whew, edgy. Um, if any of you have ever taken in my classes or watched them, right, it's not that shocking. If you study, like, modern Asia and you watch the way institutions get redone, uh, not especially shocking, actually, right? It does require a good amount of violence for that to happen. Uh, reform, that is, right? When a fa reforming failed institutions. The status quo is tempting, so... Welcome to the fun, everybody. So that gets us to the end of four. Next time we will be doing... I love this. Uh, I'm just going to read this chapter. Uh, sundry reflections on the kings of Rome. Right, so it's that tie-in. Okay, if monarchs fix it, what are kings like? Right, so we're going to be doing kings next time. And, I'm just, I'm gonna... and after that we'll be doing the introduction of new forms of government. So all this does tie together in the in the kind of broad view. So... You know, if monarchs are good, what are we looking for in a monarch? And then, okay, if monarchs can reform, how do they reform? Like, what kinds of government can they go into? So that's what we'll be working on uh, the next time. Uh, thank you all for being here. I hope you had enjoyed that. I'll uh, see you all again on the next one. Have a great evening.